badgers tend to come out around sunset, so I reckon I've about an hour to wait for them, if I'm lucky. But there's more than just badgers in this forest. And seeing this roe deer proves we're well camouflaged. I think it heard the sound of the camera. Although our eyes work well at dusk, the cameras don't. So just as we were reaching for the night vision equipment, It looks like it's the main hole, but then... It's great being able to watch them like this. You see how they come out? They follow their nose. It's like the whole animal is following a sentry like some cartoon. Their nose leads them everywhere. In fact, badgers are incredibly short-sighted, so they rely on scent to tell them what's happening. All we need now is for one of them to walk in our sand trap. Eureka! Even better. I reckon it's time we left them to their party. really nice. The badgers have been very helpful and given us the most wonderful footprints here to have a look at. Here you can see a lovely forefoot of the badger with the claw showing very clearly the long claws they use for digging and you can see look one, two, three, four toes but actually they have five. The fifth toes here you have to look very carefully to see it because they have a wide foot in hard ground that won't always show. Fantastic to be able to see all this detail. And I think this mark is made by the badger's nose as he's snuffling around for worms, whatever else he can find. And you can actually see there, in there, where the tip of his nose has been, where he's been having a little nose around for things. Wonderful. It's great looking at soft ground because there's so much detail. And once you've seen what sign the badgers are leaving, you can search for that too amongst the leaf mould all around here because it's still to be found there, but it's more difficult. And when you start to see that, then you start to become a tracker. No sooner has late spring arrived than summer is hot on its heels. July really is a wonderful month. Warm sunshine, lush vegetation, and all the summer visitors here. Really couldn't be better. The thing I like most about this time of year is finding a quiet piece of woodland where I can sit tight, practice a few skills, and just relax.
and the best way to find that quiet piece of woodland is to climb a hill. When I look at the woods like this, I try to see them through the eyes of our ancestors. And they, of course, knew all of the trees in that forest with intimacy, because they all had a meaning and a relevance. When I look at it, I see it the same way. I see friends, basically, allies in life. You can see there the, the light-coloured trees. That's a willow tree there, good for fire lighting, good for medicine, gives a string and other things. There's a lot of oak, and I can see birch trees, some ash, and various other things. And I think this is part of the magic of, of bushcraft, is it gives you a new view of your surroundings. And so if we're looking for a resource, we can come back outside of the forest, look at it, and find the tree we're looking for. It's often easier to spot it from out here than it is from in the shadows. It completely changes your view of the world around you. And all of a sudden you realize you've got friends just about everywhere you look. What I want to practice among these familiar trunks is carving. Each wood carves slightly differently. Learning how they work is all part of the tools that the Bushman carries in his armory. So to show you some carving techniques, I'll make a breadboard from sweet chestnut and string from willow bark to hang it up by. Willow's got loads of uses. One of the things it was very important for in the past was cordage, for making string, something that we take for granted today. And to make string from this, make good string from it, I need one of these shoots that's about that thick, that's slightly thicker than my wrist. And although it's going to look destructive, because I'm going to chop this whole piece down, in fact, all I'm doing is pr pruning out one branch, and this will grow again. And if you harvest this and nurture it, you can have many, many shoots, as many as you need, for all sorts of jobs, basketry, string, whatever. Whatever you take from the forest, I think it's crucial to repay the debt properly. You can do it in a number of ways. One of the things I always do with the willow is when I've taken the, the part that I need for the cord, I'll take some of these young shoots, cut them cleanly off, and push them into the ground. There's a very good chance, it being willow, that these will continue to grow and will root and become new trees. And I always make sure the cut is well tidied too, however awkward that may be. Making cord is quite a long process, but Willow is incredibly generous in giving up her bark. What I've got in this pot is some ashes from an old fire. They're a little bit damp, but um, they'll be ideal for the job. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put them in here and boil them up, and that's going to give me a, a lye solution. And into that, I'll put the strips of bark, and that's going to affect the bark in a strange way. It's going to change the colour of the bark, but also give it much greater longevity and improved flexibility. <laughs> 